I just took like the last minute. Oh, <laughs> wait. <laughs> Hold that thought. <laughs> All right, looks like we're starting without the mayor. So I will do that intro slide that I've been doing, Whitney, and then yeah. over to you. Sounds good. And then if you want to turn off your video, Jess. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us back here on this Thursday Lower Fox River Green Bay session. Um, and welcome to anybody new who's joining us. I appreciate you coming on board and spending the next hour with us. Um, I'm just going to share our screen so you have a little bit of an idea of what you've gotten yourselves into for the next hour. Um, and shamelessly promote uh, some of the talks that are coming up for the rest of the day. Um, so, for those of you who have joined us this morning, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the sessions. Right now, you are finding us at the LAND keynote uh, with major initiatives updates. So, we're going to run through a lot of information over the next hour, um, but at, uh, and I want to encourage everyone to utilize the Q&A to the right of your screen as you're viewing it in Event Mobi. Um, please utilize that. We'll be having a kind of larger free-for-all question and answer for all four of our invited speakers at the end. Um, so each speaker will have about 10 to 12 minutes to speak, and then we'll save kind of all of the questions uh, in more of like a panel type um, discussion at the end of our time together. So um, with that, I am going to stop our screen share and invite our the mayor of Green Bay, Eric Genrich, to join us. There we are. Good morning. morning. Um, so I would just like the, to invite the mayor to say a few words um, about our wonderful city, Green Bay, and some of the water quality initiatives that are close to his heart. So thank you, Mayor, for being with us. And take Absolutely. It away. Yeah, so thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited for, for Green Bay's great work um, to be the focus of some of the discussion today. Um, for those of, the, of you on the call who don't know me, I'm Eric Enrich, Mayor of Green Bay. I'm approaching two years on the job. Um, prior to that, I was in the State Assembly uh, for three terms for, for six years there. I'm born and raised in Green Bay, uh, so have a lot of, you know, strong connections to the community, obviously. Um, but, you know, having that perspective, it, it's somewhat interesting when you're talking about water, um, because obviously, you know, we sit at the the largest freshwater estuary in the world. Um, you know, we've got the Fox River, the East River, and the, and the Bay of Green Bay. Um, but at least for me, and I think for a lot of people in the community, there really wasn't a strong connection to uh, what is our most valuable natural resource um, here, which is the, the fresh water. Um, and so, you know, the, slow, the city has, has slowly been reorienting itself toward the river. Um, you know, you notice that with some of our downtown redevelopment efforts that took place under Mayor Jaden and, and Mayor Schmidt, um, the revitalization and bringing back of, uh, of a swimmable Bay Beach, which we're still in the, in the process of doing. Um, so I think we're, you know, we're slowly kind of figuring out what should have been obvious for a really long time um, that, you know, we've got to do everything we can to protect what a resource that we're so um, fortunate to be um, to be, you know, residing right next to. Um, so, you know, I've really kind of taken that to heart and, and tried to um, work in that direction as mayor of Green Bay. Um, prior to my arrival, though, you know, got a nice head start with the creation of our sustainability commission. Um, so that's really been helpful in, in kind of pushing some of these initiatives forward. But one of the things that I prioritized uh, upon being, being sworn in was identifying a way for us to, uh, to get a full-time person on staff to be able to work with that commission. So we're really fortunate now to have a full-time resiliency coordinator that works hand in, hand in hand with our sustainability commission. Melissa Schmitz has been on board for a few months and is really quarterbacking um, a lot of those efforts here in the city of Green Bay. Um, you know, we've also been, even prior to Melissa's arrival, my former chief of staff, now our city clerk, Celestine Jeffries, um, was, uh, was really front and center with some of these initiatives, um, undertaking a code audit um, to make sure that we're doing everything that we 
possibly can to implement green infrastructure and appropriate principles to, to, to um, make sure that we have a, a good handle on water quality and quantity, um, because both of those issues are really um, pressing for us. Um, also just really excited by the collaborative efforts that are that are focused on on our East River um, with the Nature Conservancy. Conservancy. Um, of course, uh, Wisconsin Sea Grant and Julian Nordyke and all the all the great things that that she and her team are up to. Um, so long story short, you know, it's taken us a while to figure out, you know, what we need to do, but I'm really confident in the path that, that we've um, set out forward for us as a community and in collaboration with so many great um, nonprofits and other governmental entities around here. So we know we have you know, a, a tall order in front of us. Um, you know, we continue to, to try to figure out the best ways to get our hands around you know, these, these kind of not necessarily consistently rising water levels, um, but water levels that erratically bounce around and make things really unpredictable, the erratic and severe, you know, rain events, weather events that we've experienced in the last few years. Um, so significant challenges, of course, on the horizon, um, but I think we're in a really good place simply because of, you know, some of the things that, that the city has done to prioritize um, clean water um, and, and as well as all the efforts of, of new water, well, as I said, surrounding municipalities, Sea Grant, Nature Conservancy, um, just feel really fortunate to be in the in the place that we are. Um, so I know you guys have a has a have a fantastic agenda in front of you. So I'll cut things there and uh, and hand things off to some other folks who are going to talk about, I believe, the Great Lakes uh, Restoration Initiative, which is a, a fantastic piece of legislation at the federal level. I know we have like strong bipartisan support um, for continuing in investments in that area. So thanks again, Aaron, for having me, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us today this, mor or this morning, Mayor. Appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you for that introduction. And now I'm going to transition over to Whitney Presti through UW Extension and have her enlighten us a little bit more about the Lower Fox River demo farms um, and how they kind of came about and what they've done for the Northeast Wisconsin region. Take it away, Whitney. It looks good. All right. Thanks, Erin. And thank you, Mayor, for uh, providing some insight and some of the exciting things happening in Green Bay. Uh, so I'm kicking off the land session this morning. Uh, we've got a lot of great talks, so I'm going to jump right into it because we've got a lot of ground to cover. So as Erin mentioned, um, I work with the Fox Demo Farms Project as the Outreach Specialist. Uh, it is a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funded project, so GLRI funding, which you're going to hear quite a bit about that over the course of the next hour. Uh, but as you can see on the right hand side of this slide, we have a number of awesome partners that we work with. Um, partners who provide technical assistance, uh, financial support. Um, honestly, this project couldn't happen without them and obviously the farmers involved in the project. So uh, we're currently working with uh, seven farms in the Lower Fox. Uh, project started out with uh, four farms, so it's grown over the last seven years. And it's exciting to announce that um, the NRCS uh, is helping to start the sixth demo farm network in eastern Wisconsin. So uh, this model is being um, replicated throughout uh, the, the Great Lakes Basin here in Wisconsin, and it's really cool to see that it's continuing to grow. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've asked the farmers to do um, over the last few years and um, what support and what they have been able to accomplish. Um, and when I first got started, Brent Peterson, who is the project manager for the Fox Demo Farms and agronomist with the, uh, Brown County, he explained it to me like this. He said, basically, we are asking farmers to get in their vehicle, drive 60 miles an hour backwards on the highway. So obviously, that puts a, a pretty solid image in your head of this is a, a pretty large undertaking and it's a completely different way of thinking about things. Um, so for those of you on the call today who um, I, this, some of this information might be new to you, I just want to give you that kind of mindset of what we're what we're asking farmers, what they've been able to accomplish. Um, you know, when we talk about it, it seems kind of like, yeah, that totally makes sense. But we're really asking them to try practices that haven't been done um, and change practices that have been going on for generations on their farm. 
So the first thing we're asking them to do is to minimize soil disturbance. So instead of in a typical conventional system, you'd probably see uh, a farm go out with some heavy equipment and till that ground a couple of times in the fall, apply their manure, let it sit bare for, for the winter and come back in and till a couple more times to dry that soil out. What we're asking them to do is to just leave that soil be, to keep it intact and use equipment that allows them to plant with a no-till system. Uh, this picture here, this is a farmer who is going in and planting, I believe this is their soybeans, but it also works with, with corn just as well. Uh, but they're actually uh, planting their primary crop in the standing rye, and this rye is probably five, five and a half feet tall, so upon about my height. Um, and they're going in and planting right into that. We call this planting green, and it's really important. We're gonna talk about cover crops, but this planting green idea is really helpful and really um, helps to reduce the amount of erosion and sediment loss that we see in, uh, in the spring when we have our, our heavy rains, our snow melts, much of what we've been seeing um, just in the last couple of days here in Green Bay. Uh, so if we can get something living on the ground and keeping that soil intact, using systems like no-till, uh, we're really able to, to really help build so, uh, soil structure. So I've mentioned cover crops. Um, if this is a, a kind of a new term to you, just think about it this way. I mean, typically we, we get in with our primary crop um, mid-May, probably planting, uh, go in and harvest around September, October, depending on what it is. Uh, then in a conventional system, you get your manure out and you're, you call it good for the year until the following spring, right? Well, what we're asking farmers to do is to find opportunities to get covers established. So having a living root year round is the goal. And so uh, cover crops, they, they really help to act as like a water pump. And this next picture kind of depicts what that water pump, um, what that looks like under the ground surface. So um, this is a picture taken last fall um, up in Kiwani County. So Aaron Augustine's farm, he's part of the Door Kiwani Demo Farms group. Uh, he, we did a virtual field day out there. So mixing things up with uh, 2020 here. Um, so uh, launched our first virtual field day uh, for that group um, out at his farm. He dug a, a soil pit. I mean, we're looking at what was going on underneath the soil surface. And as you can see here, we've got this, uh, what we call a tillage radish, um, bulk of it, you know, breaking up that compaction in that soil surface. So instead of relying on iron to, to do our uh, tillage for us, we're relying on cover crops. Um, but what's really cool too to see about this is that root structure and see how deep that goes into uh, below the soil surface. These root channels, they help to, to break up that soil. They help to create um, infiltration uh, channels for water. So, um, you know, again, what we're talking about in that, the spring, the um, heavy rains, that snow melt, that water is coming into the soil, being stored in the soil, uh, and then is able to be uh, used by, by crops throughout the summer versus a typical system where that conventional system where you would have that snow melt, that rain, just leaving the field and taking with it sediment and nutrients. Speaking of nutrients, uh, obviously here in Northeast Wisconsin, we've got a lot of big, uh, big dairy, so we have a lot of manure to deal with. And um, this, this picture, I love this picture for a couple of reasons. One, um, this is, you know, depicts one of the practices that we're, we're encouraging farms uh, to adopt. It's a low disturbance manure applicator. Um, this is really important because it helps create windows of opportunity for farmers to get out and apply their manure. One of our farmers, he, he says, you know, he describes it as, Manure is no longer a liability. It's not just something that is stressful that you're trying to get out to empty the pits going into the winter and you know it's not the, the you know, it's too much to be putting out there or you're putting it out there at the wrong time. Um, so that, that stress that in a conventional system you probably have. Um, what he says is now it's a resource that he can use for his crops. And so this is getting out there, applying that manure to a crop that's able to utilize those nutrients immediately. And that's really important because those nutrients, one, they're going on in in a lower um, quantity. So probably like in that eight to 10,000 gallons per uh, acre. So a smaller amount of manure and it's being utilized and um, taken up by the the crops that are out there, whether it's the primary crop or in this case, a, a cover crop. So the likelihood of it leaving the field is far less in this system. And the other reason I like this picture is 
This is a manure injector that's available for rent. Um, so we're probably going to hear a little bit about this. Um, Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance has teamed up. Um, Outagamie County has been kind of leading the way in Northeast Wisconsin with acquiring grants to uh, purchase equipment and making that available for, for farmers to uh, try out and see if it fits into their system. But what's really cool is this picture and this piece of equipment was taken up in Sturgeon Bay in North County. So that the collaborative mindset and effort that um, Northeast Wisconsin has is just phenomenal. And it's really cool to see that, you know, county um, boundaries, you know, that doesn't really mean anything. We're, we're trying to get as many farmers uh, doing these practices as possible. Whoops. So how are we doing that? So there's a few different ways. Um, peer to peer learning, though, is really important. This is a, a picture taken a few years back um, at a field day. Um, Jamie Patton, uh, one of our specialists with UW, um, out doing what she does best, talking about soils in a soil pit. Uh, farmers getting the opportunity to learn from their peers about what works, what doesn't work. Um, and a really exciting thing that I'm looking forward to uh, piloting this year, where we've got a few farmers lined up to serve as our first um, Fox Demo Farms mentors. Um, so they're going to be paired up with farmers who are just getting started with these practices and meeting with them uh, on a regular basis, helping them as they work through some of these, these challenges that, um, that uh, farmers have to overcome to adopt these practices. So I look forward to hearing more about that from us um, in the coming years, but we're looking to, to do a two-year pilot of a mentorship program. And the last thing I just want to talk about, so I've talked a lot about working with farmers and obviously that's a primary goal of our, our project, but getting the community out to experience agriculture and experience what conservation agriculture is doing for our watershed is really important. Uh, Brickstead Dairy has been a fantastic partner in Sunset on the Farm. Uh, we've done this three years now, uh, the last two years, 2018, 2019, we had about 500 people out um, to the farm. So just an awesome opportunity to get urban folks out to um, an agricultural setting and learning about these practices. So I know we're going to be taking questions at the end, um, but I did just want to put my contact information up. If you have any uh, questions that, um, about the project, I'd be happy to, to answer those in more depth. Um, I'm going to stop sharing here and turn things over to Aaron Houghton, uh, New Waters uh, Watershed Programs Manager. Uh, she's been an awesome partner with her team um, in the watershed. They're doing a lot of fantastic work. So excited to hear more from Aaron. Awesome. Thank you, Whitney. And for those of you who have been with us all day, I just now realize that I never introduced myself to all of you. So now I'm changing hats and we'll be presenting. So thank you, Whitney. I'm Erin Houghton. I'm the Watershed Programs Manager with New Water, the Green Bay Metropolitan Sewerage District. Um, so today, I just want to uh, start off by introducing you to the Sewerage District. Uh, we are actually located with our Green Bay facility at the mouth of the Fox River. Uh, we do also have a De Pere facility as well up by the fairgrounds, if folks are familiar with that location. Uh, collectively, we are treating about 41 million gallons per day, uh, so we like to think that we are cleaning up the Fox River with 41 million gallons per day. Um, we do have 15 municipal customers, and we've treated just over uh, 18 billion with a B gallons in 2019. We're still working on the, the 2020 figures, so stay tuned for that. But as a point source discharger uh, to waters of the state, uh, we are governed by a permit through DNR um, as a discharge, point source discharger. These permits uh, run for a five year cycle. Uh, we had our last one that was issued in July of 2014. And we've been uh, renewing our current permit with the DNR for the last uh, little over a year. Um, and we are uh, anticipating a new start to a new permit in 2021. Uh, in this new permit, uh, the, and we were made aware of this when our uh, permit started in 2014, uh, was the coming of new total phosphorus and total suspended solids um, limits for our facility to meet. And so we had the last permit cycle to figure out how, in fact, we were going to meet these new limits. Um, obviously, new construction at our facility um, is always an option. Um, and to address and make sure we were 
hitting these new limits reliably and consistently, uh, that would in, in fact uh, include going with tertiary treatment uh, through, membra through membranes specifically, which is quite costly and we're looking at well over $100 million. Um, and this is coming on the heels of just recently uh, concluding an overhaul on our solids treatment. Um, in this image, you can see the two tall cylinders. Those are our new digesters that we have incorporated into our solids treatment before incineration. The other options that we looked at for treating our uh, liquid waste stream or liquid um, effluent uh, back out to the Fox River was um, other compliance options provided by Wisconsin DNR. And so we looked at trading, we looked at a variance, um, and then we also looked at something called adaptive management. And this was very intriguing to us. Uh, we had the feeling that this could be a viable option for new water. So we initially started a pilot project for the last six years in the Silver Creek watershed to see if we could be successful reducing uh, nutrients and sediment from the watershed uh, from getting into local streams and rivers. Um, so by way of trying to meet water quality standards in these uh, in impaired waterways that we have in our community. And so, you know, these streams and uh, local waters are impaired. We've kind of seen this figure in other presentations today. Um, we've by and large dealt with a lot of the point sources uh, through regulation, through permitting, um, but we really are seeing uh, a lot of the water quality issues stick around. And what we're kind of left with is how we address non-point source runoff. And so that is why we really thought this watershed approach would be an interesting option for new water. So building on the heels of our successful pilot project, we were in fact able to make a lot of wonderful new partnerships, um, as well as um, getting a lot of new practices installed on the watershed. And Whitney did a great job of introducing you to a few of those um, watershed uh, program opportunities. And so we've now developed the new watershed program, um, and this is our compliance program going forward. So we have proposed to DNR that we would like to do adaptive management, as a way in, uh, to meet our new phosphorus and suspended solids uh, limits going forward. And so we do have conditional approval from DNR right now for that. So as we're at the mouth of the Fox River, we had the wonderful entire lower Fox River watershed at our disposal to work within uh, to uh, account for the reductions as listed in the total maximum daily load that kind of governs our um, uh, reductions for this region. And so we uh, identified two subwatersheds to focus on for the, the majority of our adaptive management plan, and that's a Schwabenen Creek and Dutchman Creek just along the western shoreline of the Lower Fox River. Program goals moving forward, obviously we need to uh, have set goal reductions. And so what that looks like in, in pounds uh, for new water is 18,911 pounds per year of total phosphorus. So we need to achieve that amount of reduction of phosphorus over a 20 year timeline or four permit terms. Um, so that's been dictated by DNR as the, as the maximum uh, time to meet those reductions. And then 3.9 million pounds uh, per year of sediment. Um, we're also continuing, we've already established a water quality monitoring program, biological monitoring program, um, in conjunction with UW Green Bay and Oneida Tribe. Um, so those three things are, are happening. So it's habitat, biology, and water quality. Um, those have been going on since two, uh, 2018 and will be going on for the duration of the, pro of the program. Um, and for reference, we are also trying to meet a water quality standard of 0.075 milligrams per liter of total phosphorus in both the Schwabenen and Dutchman Creeks. Obviously, we're going to be doing our best to implement as many best, uh, best management practices uh, to really maximize the extent of uh, reduction possible. Um, obviously, it's not all agricultural. Uh, about half the watershed is agricultural land use and about half is urban. Um, so this will be new to us in working more in the in urban environment, um, but just as important uh, a piece of the story for reductions. We do want to maintain and build partnerships. So we did a wonderful job of creating partnerships that we value very much and have been able to leverage expertise that these partnerships bring from our pilot project. Um, and we've really welcomed them and they've uh, you know, happily agreed to stick with us here for the long haul for adaptive management um, as the program moves forward into this new subwatershed area. 
Um, and then really building, uh, building our approach and really trying to make these changes sustainable in the watershed. We want our agriculture in our region to be effective and um, sustainable long term. This is their business. And we also want clean water for, you know, Northeast Wisconsin. And so it, it definitely is about finding the best ways to manage um, each person's operation, um, you know, how to improve and manage uh, the different land uh, regions throughout the, the two sub watersheds. And so that's a fun, um, fun challenge for all of us, uh, but it, it's really been a positive working experience so far. And the one thing that we can absolutely take away from all of this is that adaptive management must be adaptive. And so we have several different categories here that really are um, crucial in putting together a successful adaptive management uh, program. And I think I've touched on several of these. Um, I, it would not be a, a, an effective program, however, without um, kind of the social aspect. And that I think has been one thing that we've found as surprising as to how much effort uh, a, a program um, needs to really have on the social component, just that relationship building, the, the landowner communication, it's those reach outs, it's those purposeful meetings, um, and it's that communication that really takes this, these programs um, to the next level and really makes them effective in their communities. Obviously, some of it is technical um, and a bit administrative, and like every good program uh, needs a little bit of luck. So moving forward, um, just really hoping to continue program development uh, and some initial implementation in 2021 as we kind of hit the ground running here. We'll obviously be continuing our water quality monitoring um, and really all of this in an effort to build a more resilient landscape, as I mentioned before, um, and shift that mindset of our partners and landowners. Like I said, none of this could be possible without the wonderful program partners that we've established through this process of the pilot and getting our adaptive management program up and running. So thank you to all of those wonderful folks. And then thank you for your participation and uh, listening today. Uh, that was a lot in a very short amount of time. So please feel free to email me at my contact information provided. Um, and please visit our website at newwater.us for more information. Um, and if you're on social media, feel free to utilize the hashtag love your watershed as we continue these efforts. Um, so with that, I am going to stop my portion and happily turn it over uh, to Jessica Schultz, who is going to be giving you um, some insight as to what uh, her or wonderful organization has contributed into the, the Lower Fox River watershed. So Jessica, take it away. You look good. <laughs> Thanks, Erin. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, okay, great. Thank you for that confirmation. Um, hello, thanks for inviting me to be part of Wisconsin Water Week. Um, my presentation was titled, What a Team Approach, Watershed Recovery in the Plum and Kinkapop Creeks. And I have to thank whoever that was part of the organizing committee came up with that clever name. So I'm always trying to think of catchy titles, but never can. Um, so whoever came up with that one, thank you so much. Um, because I was asked to talk a bit about how nonprofits could become partners in watershed recovery, I wanted to take a minute to introduce our organization to those that may not be familiar with the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance. Fox Wolf is a nonprofit that works with partners to protect and restore the water resources of the Fox Wolf River Basin. We're a watershed organization that believes a holistic approach to watershed management is necessary in order to meet our goals. Uh, we're small but continually growing, um, focused on finding cost-effective science-based solutions and working with partners to maximize efficiencies, um, bringing resources to those who are already doing great work, not reinventing the wheel, um, but you utilizing our strengths to fill the gaps when needed. Um, I'm going to make the assumption that since you're all here today, you value the land and water resources in Northeast Wisconsin. Um, just like you, our organization celebrates our water resources. Uh, we sure do have a lot to be grateful for and abundant, um, our abundant waters make it possible for us to enjoy swimming and fishing, boating, bird watching, um, and so much more. 
Um, and while we value the waters as they are, we've heard a lot about the problems that our waters face today. Uh, we acknowledge that they're degraded. Uh, while there's a lot of issues of concerns for our waterways, uh, the primary cause of our water quality problems in our watershed right now is pollution carried to our waterways through runoff from the land. And that's the main focus of, of the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance. I'm going to spend the majority of my time today talking about the awesome work being done in the Plum and Kink Pot Creek watersheds. But before I get there, I'm going to talk about how we got there, worked with partners, um, how we got where we're at with agricultural implementations. And after I talk about the Plum and Kink Pot, I'm briefly going to talk about additional implementation progress made in the Lower Fox, as well as introduce you all to some work happening further up in the watershed in the Winnebago system. Uh, since the conference is bringing together a great mix of community members interested in protecting our waterways with conservation professionals, I want to take a step back for a minute just to make sure that we're all on the same page. A lot of where we're at with the recovery work um, happening right now started because of a TMDL report completed by Wisconsin DNR. A TMDL or a total maximum daily load is a study of a watershed. It determines how much pollution a water body can handle before it becomes impaired. It identifies the sources of pollution and then sets essentially a, a pollution diet um, for each source, outlining the reduction it would take from each pollutant source in order to meet water quality goals. The Lower Fox River TMDL, which is um, the area from the Bay of Green Bay to the, the mouth of Lake Winnebago um, was complete in 2012. The upper Fox Wolf, which is the rest of the Fox Wolf Basin, uh, that part of the watershed had its TMDL complete this past year in 2020. A TMDL provides a lot of great information about the watershed. But most importantly, the TMDL describes where the pollution load is coming from. Um, so you can see here, this is the TMDL information for the Lower Fox River. The orange parts are the, are the load from agriculture, which is why we spent so much time today talking about agriculture. TMDL also identifies the reduction that would be required from those sources in order to meet water quality goals. Um, what you see here on the left is the Plum Creek total phosphorus page from the Lower Fox River TMDL. Now that's a lot of information and the numbers are too small probably to read on the screen, um, but what I can see here is it says that the reduction from ag agriculture requires over a 76% reduction in phosphorus loading from Plum Creek alone. So that's a lot of reductions that we're talking about. So the TMDL study itself is not a regulatory document. It is what it is. It's a study. Uh, the required reductions for wastewater and urban stormwater in the Lower Fox River have now been worked into permit requirements like Aaron talked about just a minute ago. So those permit requirements are for individual entities. The TMDL describes how much needs to be reduced. The permit requires those entities to do that for wastewater and urban stormwater. But agriculture is different. There's not permit requirements for farms to reduce TSS or phosphorus runoff to TMDL standards, which is why as a nonprofit, we got involved with watershed recovery from the agricultural side. As conservation partners, we needed to work together to figure out how to advance TMDL targets for agricultural implementation. Um, it was back in 2013 um, that Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance really got involved with our agricultural partners. Keith Marcourt, who is the Lower Fox River TMDL coordinator for Wisconsin DNR, called a small group together back in 2013 uh, to begin to strategize just how we could work together to meet our goals. Um, because we knew it would take a long time to see the results of conservation in the Bay of Green Bay or even in the Fox River, the group decided to work as a watershed team, prioritizing implementation in the highest loading um, by highest loading watersheds by agricultural acre um, first before moving on to another watershed so that we could measure results in a particular stream or creek. 
We believe that showing results through prioritization and strategic implementation was important in order to build momentum and support from additional partners or funders. The highest loading watershed was identified as the Plum and Kankapot Creek watersheds. Outagamie County wrote a nine key element plan, which is a detailed plan of how to meet water quality goals in a watershed. Um, and that plan was complete in 2014. Uh, that plan qualified the watershed for additional federal grants. I described that our organization works to bring resources to those who are already doing great work and fills the gaps where needed. And that's exactly what we did in 2014. Fox Wolf applied for a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative grant and secured that funding uh, in 2015. The grant brought in funding for three additional land conservation department staff, two for Outagamie County and one for Brown. Uh, the additional boots on the ground increased the ability of the counties to develop trusted relationships with the farmers in the Plum and Kankapot Creek watersheds. They were able to work with farmers to find conservation solutions that worked for their individual farm. And Whitney in her presentation earlier described a lot of these conservation practices that we're utilizing in the Plum and Kankapot Creek watersheds. The flexibility of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative grant funding through EPA allowed us to purchase equipment um, to allow farmers to try equipment before they buy it. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this. Whitney referenced how valuable that was to have equipment available in her presentation as well. But I do want to say that this try before you buy philosophy uh, has been working. We've seen private investment from farmers um, in conservation equipment. Uh, we've also seen private haulers um, learn about this conservation equipment and then purchase it for their business as well within the watershed. Additionally, organizations like Nature Conservancy and Fund for Lake Michigan have also invested in additional equipment for the watershed. Because of the success of the equipment program started with GLRI investment, Outagamie County with support from Oneida Nation, New Water and Brown County has established a soil health equipment and demonstration facility known as the SHED. Uh, this 25-acre facility will showcase in innovative equipment and cropping practices, as well as um, be a place for farmers to gather for farmer meetings. GLRI has also supported regional outreach through the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance. We've been able to work with our partners to publish a semi-annual newsletter that we call the Basin Buzz that gets sent out to 500 farmers in the Lower Fox River. Since this project started, we've been able to replicate the Basin Buzz and send it out to farmers in Shawano and Menominee counties as well. And this year we will be starting to send it to farmers in the Winnebago system. Beyond the soil health practices like cover crop and reduced till or no-till planting, a lot of great conservation work um, was getting done through this initial GLRI grant. We knew that additional implementation funds would be needed. So we applied for additional funding in 2016 and were awarded a second grant for the Plum and Kankapot, which increased staff at Calumet County. Having the county staff to work with landowners to install practices has been, in my opinion, and it sounds like Erin's when she talked about the social component of New Waters Project, one of the most important components of the success that we've had. Um, I'm really happy to report that since the end of this grant, Calumet County has increased their county levy contribution to the Land Conservation Department to keep Jonathan, who is the technician hired through this grant, um, on as a permanent employee, so expanding their capacity with local funds. The investment from GLRI and the successes that came with it didn't stop with those two grants. We got additional grant in um, 2017 to start work in the Upper East River. Outagamie County at that same time secured funding through GLRI to start work in Upper Duck. So we're moving on as we are, are seeing a lot of implementation in one watershed. We're moving on to those high, next higher loading watersheds. 
And this last year we um, secured a third grant for the Plumbing King Kapot Creek. This project is really exciting because county staff will be working very closely with three farms to not only install conservation practices, but work with these farmers to identify and overcome barriers of, to adoption of these practices. Uh, just like the demonstration farm network that Whitney talked about, lessons learned from these farmers will be shared with neighboring farms so that we can, we can continue to move um, from paying for conservation practices to providing farmers with the resources needed to change their operation um, to incorporate conservation practices, truly adopting the practices instead of just installing the practices. Before I wrap up, I want to quick highlight the work partnerships have been doing upstream from the Lower Fox River. In 2016, Winnebago, Calumet, and Fond du Lac counties signed an intergovernmental cooperative agreement to work together to protect and restore the Winnebago system. They hired the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance as the regional coordinator and the Winnebago Waterways program got started. The first efforts of the regional collaboration was to write a lake management plan and nine key element plan for the Winnebago Waterways Recovery Area, which is a subset of the larger Fox Wolf Basin. And then last year, utilizing a nine key element plan um, for the Fond du Lac portion of the Pipe Creek watershed that was written by Fond du Lac County, um, Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance was awarded a GLRI grant to increase the capacity of the Fond du Lac County Land Conservation Department and work with farmers on soil health practices in Pipe Creek. As you can see, great work is happening in the lower Fox River watershed and throughout the basin. Um, I wish I had more time today because there's exciting projects happening all over the basin that I'd love to tell you about. Um, beyond the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding that has come directly from EPA, which I talked about today, financial and implementation support has come from a variety of other sources as well. Um, large contributions from the DNR targeted runoff management grant program, Great Lakes Commissions, Great Lakes Sediment and Nutrient Reduction program and NRCS have all um, been utilized in the Lower Fox. By working together as a watershed team, we've been making lots of great progress, but we have a long way to go. Um, we are working with partners right now on a planning effort for the Lower Fox River watershed that will explore funding, policy, building engagement of additional partners, tracking and reporting, and more. The goal of this planning effort is to develop a strategy that will take us from the current level of implementation to the level of ugh, to the level of implementation that we need to be at in order to meet our goals in the Lower Fox River watershed over the next 20 years. Whether you're a conservation professional or an engaged citizen, there will be ways for you to get involved over the next year, and I hope that you will. Um, Bree, who is talking next, may tell you a bit more about this effort, but I know she has a lot to cover, so just in case she didn't have time to put out a call for action, I wanted to include it in my time as well. If you want to get engaged in the Lower Fox River planning effort, please reach out to myself or Katie Woodrow, who is our Lower Fox River Watershed Coordinator, to do that. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bree Kupski, who is the Green Bay AOC Coordinator at Wisconsin DNR. And Bree, I'm sorry if I stepped on your presentation toes by sharing this slide about the planning effort. No, not at all. I'm glad that you did, actually. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. All right. Hopefully you guys can hear me and can see my uh, slides here. Can I get a nod? Yes, okay. Can't see your slides yet. Can't see them yet? Oh, okay, that's because I have to share my screen. There. Looks good. Okay, thanks Erin. All right, um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Jessica, for the introduction. Um, I'm just gonna take the next few minutes to share some highlights on the decade's worth of effort to um, restore the Lower Green Bay and Fox River AOC and where this work is headed for the future, um, particularly for our program's effort in working with you know, the many partners that are working on addressing water quality issues in this region. Um, before I get started, thanks to everyone who's helped uh, coordinate Wisconsin Water Week for hosting this great event. I know it's a ton of work to coordinate um, and to get all this great information out about improving our water resources um, in our region and statewide. All right, um, so I'm just going to uh, provide a little bit of context about this program. Um, there are 43 areas of concern throughout the Great Lakes region with 31 in the US. 
And why these locations were designated in the first place is that they're often heavily urbanized and industrialized harbors um, that had really significant or have really significant sediment contamination, water quality problems, and degraded fish and wildlife resources. Um, these issues have both posed a threat to human and, um, and fish and wildlife health and other impacts to the way that we um, use and access and enjoy the water. And they also have the potential to impact um, the broader Great Lakes ecosystem. So they're very highly prioritized for remediation and restoration efforts nationally. Um, in Wisconsin, there were five areas of concern originally de designated. Um, the Lower Menominee River is the first in Wisconsin that actually just had its designation removed last year um, because many partners in that area worked together for decades um, to achieve goals that took that area out of the se severely degraded category it was once in. So that's been a really important, exciting milestone um, for our state and for that community. And I find it really helpful to look at the historical context to communicate, you know, why these areas were designated in the first place. So some examples are things like in Marinette, where you had, you know, a 30 foot high pile of arsenic salt um, that had been running off into the Menominee River for years. Um, you know, you had in Sheboygan, untreated wastewater containing detergents um, and other uh, toxic contaminants was, you know, being run off into the river, um, causing these huge foams to pile up along the banks of the Sheboygan River. Sheboygan river. And then in Milwaukee, there are records of um, actually being able to, at times, light Leakin Creek on fire due to all the uh, petroleum runoff. And of course, in Green Bay, there were reports, you know, that fish like sturgeon were once so plentiful that commercial fishermen actually used to, you know, stack them like cordwood to get them out of the way um, because they were damaging their nets. And then compare that to reports, you know, newspaper articles just 50 years later that described how nearly no fish were able to exist in either the East or Fox rivers. Um, so in a really short time, um, what had been one of the most productive fisheries in Wisconsin and the Great Lakes region had become um, pretty nearly unsuitable for life due to a lot of major industrial activity on the Fox River, such as paper mill operations um, that discharge a lot of environmental contaminants. Um, so many of these sources of these problems were um, eventually cut off through initiation of policies such as like the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act, as well as other state and local regulations. Um, but we still really have this major problem with how to deal with all the legacy pollutants um, and sediment contamination. Um, you know, back in sort of the 1980s, there wasn't a great pathway to get legacy contaminants and other issues um, in AOC's remediated, remedi remediated. Um, and that's what really prompted that AOC designation. Um, so each of the Great Lakes states uh, worked with technical experts, local leaders, and the local community to develop plans um, to basically describe what the problems in the area were and a means of addressing those problems. Um, and generally, uh, we fit uh, the problems that we were experiencing in this AOC fit into three major categories. So uh, we needed to address contaminated sediments, uh, degraded fish and wildlife populations and habitat, integrated water quality from toxic substances and excess nutrient and sediment runoff. So how are we doing in those three categories? You know, I'm just gonna touch on contaminated sediment very briefly. Um, and that was a problem because of course the PCBs that were released into the Fox River. Um, this project was completed in 2020 and over the last 15 years enough PCB contaminated sediment was remediated that if you were to load all that sediment into dump trucks and line them up, they'd actually span from Green Bay all the way to London, England. So a lot, a lot of sediment taken out of this river. Um, this project was paid for in full by responsible parties, not taxpayers, and there were around 140 workers on site daily, which brought in a talented workforce that, you know, really enhanced our local economy. Um, there was a lot of direct and indirect benefits from this project, and its completion really represents one of the most significant milestones um, in the restoration of this area of concern and across the Great Lakes. Um, another thing we've been working on through coordination with many different par partners is improving fish and wildlife habitat. One of the figurehead projects is the Cat Island and Restoration Chain. Um, that had been identified as a, a necessary project back in 1988, um, and restoration became a reality in 2013 through incredible persistence and coordination of um, a lot of partners and community members. Um, additionally, a large group of partners has been working in the last few years to come up with a list of habitat restoration projects to meet um, additional fish and wildlife goals because we know there's a lot more work needed and we're really hoping to get some exciting projects off the ground in, over the next few years. And of course, there's a lot of other partners who've been working um, incrementally for decades um, to improve fish and wildlife habitat, too many to name here, but you know, Brown County has been working to improve um, you know, pike spawning marshes and there's been a lot of great work um, that's been made possible through the Fox River Natural Resource Damage Assessment. So um, that work is all gonna continue and uh, we really are appreciative of the partners who have been um, pushing that forward. 
And as far as our last major category, improving water quality is obviously a big work in progress for this entire region. And it's really reflected within the AOC boundary since the Fox River is really the end of the pipe that carries stormwater runoff um, into the bay that carries, you know, the nutrients and the sediment um, and fuels these algae blooms that can, you know, degrade water quality, um, can degrade fish and wildlife habitat, and also pose a really significant public health risk at times. Um, as you've heard today, a lot of where this is coming from is non-point source runoff, so our program is one of several um, that are working together with agricultural producers and communities to find ways to reduce the stormwater runoff. And I really want to reiterate what you've heard from others um, probably throughout the session and throughout this entire week, which is, you know, it's going to take more work, more people, and more investment to really get after water quality issues in this region um, and reach our water quality goals. Um, so as others have touched on, much of the work, uh, current funding to do that work improve, um, to improve water quality comes from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, the graph on the right um, shows years on the bottom and then environmental problems or impairments um, removed in areas of concern on the left. And you'll see that the removal of these problems was pretty slow until the onset of GLRI. And as soon as we had that dedicated source of funding to address Great Lakes issues, we really started to see an exponential increase in those um, problems being removed in the Great Lakes and making progress at the AOCs. Um, GLRI has also generated really important economic and social benefits as well. Um, a recent study from um, University of Michigan found that for every dollar of GLRI funding invested, there's around a $3.35 return on investment to local communities and additional economic activity through things like tourism, property values, and um, just general quality of life. Um, within the GLRI, there are five discrete focus areas, all of which have their own general rules or guidance for how they administer funding and for what types of projects. Focus area one is called toxic substances or areas of concern or and areas of concern. And it's really only administered for projects um, within AOC boundaries that make progress for the AOC goals. Um, this focus area generally receives the largest portion of the overall GLRI annually. Um, and that's because AOCs represent this, you know, really discrete localized area where it's easier for people to see progress that the funding um, makes in AOC communities and is a large part why we can continue to see such strong bipartisan support for this initiative, um, which is unique nationally. Um, much of the work you heard from Whitney and Jessica that was supported by GLRI um, comes from the um, non-point source pollution impacts on near shore health or focus area three, this one here. Um, and there's a different process and funding guidance for what's appropriately funded through that focus area relative to the one for AOCs. Um, in addition to projects needing to be implemented within an area of concern boundaries to access those focus area one funds from GLRI, there's also characteristics um, of projects um, that are being funded that you generally need to demonstrate. Um, project funding you know, can't be administered to help achieve regulatory or permit compliance functions. Projects are expected to sort of last in perpetuity and projects need to address localized or lake of the sea sources of pollution. So it makes it a little difficult for our program um, who really sees the impacts of um, poor water quality within our boundaries, but can't necessarily access the funding through our typical channels to address water quality meaningfully, um, since most of where the problems are, reside are, you know, way outside the AOC boundaries in the watershed. And the type of work that we do doesn't always lend itself to follow those sideboards um, that the AOC projects normally have. Um, but we've worked with partners over the last seven or eight years to figure out, you know, what it is that our program can contribute to solving water quality issues and how we can leverage those focus area one GLRI funds to help accelerate the pace and scale of water quality improvements in our lower Fox watershed. One way we've done this is to partner with Outagamie County who created these great maps you're seeing here um, that show, you know, where we've lost important water storage capacity in our lower Fox watershed. So we can try to really focus our work there. What we learned from that project from a land management perspective is that we've really lost a lot of water storage that wetlands that have been converted once provided and that we really need to figure out um, in this region how to restore water storage and decrease runoff which will in turn improve water quality. Um, and how we're going to try to tackle this is um, basically you know we take those maps and we figure out what kind of projects we think fit within those AOC um, project characteristics. And we are working with many different partners throughout the basin to develop a list of projects um, that will essentially establish uh, what we call a treatment train. So in the headwaters, you have these sort of detention basins um, or wetlands implemented that hold and slowly release water that return that water storage service and trap nutrients. Just downstream, you'd have various edge of field practices um, and stream bank stabilization um, that also you know, help uh, retain nutrients and store water. Um, 
And on top of that, we'd like to pair this work with where producers are implementing in-field BMPs like cover crops and some of the other things that Whitney and Jessica have talked about so that we can really evaluate how these conservation practices work when they're implemented together. Um, and how much of that work to do has been a big focus of our program for the last few years. Um, our program is different than others in that it really represents a defined endpoint. The whole purpose of our program is to remove impairments and ultimately delist the area of concern. So we have to have clear targets that are, um, you know, really specific and time bound and fits within the scope of our program. Pretty tall order. Um, there's been a lot of deep dives for many years by many partners um, to try to figure out how to set a target with all those programmatic sideboards. Um, but DNR has been collaborating with Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance and Alliance for the Great Lakes. And together, organizations um, are coordinating with many partners to develop a lower Fox water quality management plan. One of the work groups contributing to the overall planning effort is actually currently drafting an approach that will go up for public comment in mid-2021. And that approach focuses on our program, the AOC program, um, essentially trying to work to reduce an equivalent amount of nutrient and sediment loading that's attributed to urban unregulated sources that were identified in the lower Fox MDL. Um, urban unregulated areas are generally smaller rural, com rural communities that aren't regulated through MS4 permits, so there's not a good pathway to um, see reductions um, in loading from them. And that sort of checks off our, you know, can't do work that, you know, achieves a regulatory or permit compliance box. Um, it's a more localized source of pollution, which also tends to check off um, that, that box of legacy or localized um, sources of pollution. And we can implement practices that essentially remove that loading permanently with checks off another box for our program in terms of the kinds of projects we usually do. We're also evaluating where we want um, to target that work and we're looking to watersheds that are, you know, generally close to the AOC boundaries, such as Bear Creek, which is the sub watershed on the map you're currently seeing. And that was also developed by Outagamie County. Um, so just to kind of summarize, um, I think it's a great approach. Um, it's really somewhat still a stretch for GLRI focused area one funding um, as work outside of AOC boundaries very rarely happens. So, uh, you know, if there's any call to action um, from me, um, just to kind of top what um, or build on what um, Jessica said, it's for our AOC stakeholders to support this ask of GLRI and see this problem for what it is, which is something that requires some really outside the AOC boundary solutions um, and our stakeholders, I don't know, we've realized remarkable things before, pushing for the largest PCB cleanup globally, implementing one of the premier habitat restoration projects throughout the Great Lakes and Cat Island, um, and with all the work of tenacious, tenacious partners, each taking a bite off this problem, um, I think that we're going to actually realize those water quality goals. And I'm very excited to see how that continues to shape up so that we can keep turning around and facing the water again. So thanks to, again to Aaron and all the people who've hosted Wisconsin Water Week. Um, if you have questions, I guess you can ask now or contact me by phone or email. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Bree. At this time, I'd like uh, all four of our presenters to, yeah, thanks. Well, perfect. Uh, so everybody's got their video on. We do have a few questions that have come in uh, for the presenters. So um, I'm going to kick it off with a question for Whitney that came in. Whitney, uh, if you could uh, help answer this question. Do farmers need to pay for the equipment rental or does the grant cover costs? Yeah, so I can start this off and Jess, feel free to, to hop in if um, you have some more insight on this since I know you've been really active with the grant funding. Um, so the majority of the time, no, the farmers don't have to um, pay anything for, for renting the equipment. Um, in a few cases, I know there's, it, it depends on, you know, the grant um, and that specific equipment. Sometimes they have to pay for uh, gas, you know, to, to run it on their fields, but it's usually very minimal. Um, I know there's been conversations about as, you know, we get further and further away from that funding source, um, you know, to keep these, this equipment in, you know, use throughout the watershed. There might be some small fees for just maintenance and things like that. But uh, for the most part, no, the, the um, equipment is free for use or very minimal expense. Great, thank you. And I will say too, um, I'm glad Jessica brought up the shed uh, building a, and uh, a co cooperative. Um, our new water program and our compliance adaptive management program is also a part of that. Um, and so it'll be great to kind of try to bring a lot of shared resources together for, for use across multiple different program efforts in Northeast Wisconsin. 
All right, Jessica, next up, we've got a question for you. Uh, similar on equipment, um, which pieces of equipment have proven the most popular with farmers in Northeast Wisconsin? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the equipment that we've had the longest has been um, manure injection equipment. So that has gotten the, a lot of use over the years and continues to. Um, part of the problem that we have with cover with getting cover crops on early is the need to um, put manure out. So the manure injection equipment allows for a different way to manage manure. Um, we also there are also interseeders in the watershed which allow so, um, farmers to plant cover crops between rows of growing corn and that has also become more popular as well as the push to get cover crops on earlier and Im improve that soil health um, becomes larger in the watershed. Great, thank you. And that is a good plug. I know uh, with the Heavy precipitation years in 2018 and 2019, that kind of sent a lot of the farmers in Northeast Wisconsin into a frenzy of how they were going to um, continue to get cover crops out. And I think that really forced looking at aerial seeding and trying to push the utilizing of no-till and uh, inner seeding, uh, especially with corn. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. And as we, a lot of folks know in Northeast Wisconsin, we do have an abundance of manure that goes along with our, our wonderful dairy industry. And so trying to be smarter with the manure as a resource that we do have up here and getting it out on the fields throughout the growing season and not just in the fall, I think has been a big push as well. So thanks for bringing up the manure injector technology. Bree, last but not least, we do have a question for you as well. Um, so you shared the AOC map earlier in your slides. Um, does, uh, and then in quotation marks here, does the man management actions completed mean that all man management actions are completed for that AOC or for a given AOC? Maybe just kind of running through the different terminology that's associated with an AOC as it progresses. Yeah, so management actions for an AOC are really specific. Um, they're on a list that we need to submit for approval for funding um, or for at least some funding um, from Dealer I Focus Area 1. So um, as far as the management actions complete AOC, that does mean that like every single thing that you've submitted on your list or on several lists has then been completely implemented and is done. So Green Bay is not um, expected to be sort of a management actions implemented AOC for several, several years. Hopefully that answers that question. Great, thank you. All right, we are at 12.30. Thank you again, everyone, for participating and sending in your questions. Thank you to our wonderful presenters. Um, we really encourage everyone to join us back here. We have our lunch break, but please join us back for a fun uh, activity of playing Jeopardy as a way of learning some more fun facts about uh, Northeast Wisconsin. Even if you're from Northeast Wisconsin, I really encourage you to play. You might learn something new. So uh, please join us back here at 1.15. Um, and again, just thank you to everyone participating today. We'll see you later. <laughs>